Well, you could imagine setting up a moon water um, plant yeah. and then send the stuff back to the earth. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if people would spend, um, <laughs> you know, a hundred thousand dollars for 12 ounces of moon water. Yeah. Uh, Nestle will be out there straight away. <laughs> Yeah, so water on the moon. So it looked like uh, NASA was dangling this for a couple of days. They were flirting with dropping a hint about a finding about the moon. And now they've uh, said that they have an unambiguous detection of molecular water on the sunlit side of the moon. So the previous detections, um, I think there was one in 2008, 2009 from the Chandrayaan uh, 1 spacecraft, Indian spacecraft. They'd always been in these cold traps, these sort of shadowy areas of the moon where sunlight hasn't been able to reach. But now we have this unambiguous detection of molecular water on the, the sunlit parts of the moon. So it's so it's something new. Yeah. So um, I remember the first detection that I recall of water on the moon was like early 2000s, 2003, 2004, something like that. Um, and so the discussion for a long time was if we wanted to send people to the moon to live, then we would have to capture the water, mm -hmm. you know, go basically mine the water um, in the on the poles. Yeah. Um, in the craters of the po near the poles and then bring them down so that we could melt them and drink it. Uh, so in this case, the fact that they saw it on the on the daylight side. Um, unambiguous detection. Now, un unfortunately, there's been other unambiguous detections lately that have uh, not aged well. Um, <laughs> and so I and, and this is in nature, which doesn't help it either. So. so 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 the important thing to say is that unambiguous detections don't always remain unambiguous for yeah, for long. Exactly. But let's uh -huh. let, let, let's assume this one has been found. We found. Yeah. So Back to the, the yeah, subject. we found molecular water on the sunlit side of the moon, and as as I said, that the previous detections have always been in these permanently sun shaded areas, and now we've got it in this sunlit area. So the the previous ones that you mentioned in two thousand and three, two thousand eight, two thousand nine, this Indian spacecraft Chandrayaan one supposedly found water. So so we've been finding water on the moon for a while, but we haven't been finding it in the sunlit areas. Um, how how did they make this discovery? Because it looks like there's two methods or, or two papers that have sort of come out, two ideas. One's this airborne infrared uh, telescope, Sophia, which I wouldn't uh -huh. mind you telling me a little bit about because it sounds very interesting. I think it's it's inside a plane or something, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's going to be great. So, yeah, I can talk about that. Yeah, and then the Lunar Recon Orbiter, Reconnaissance Orbiter, so there seems to be two things. One, they found a molecular signature of water using Sophia. And then this lunar recon orbiter has gone around and found that there's a hell of a lot of shadows and pits on the moon, more than we thought shadowed area where water could be hiding in the, sh in the shade. So we found much more shaded area where water and ice could be and also mm. found that water exists in sunlit areas with this Sophia measurement. So it seems... Mm water's all over the place, whereas before we only thought it was in these shaded areas or at the poles. Yeah, and so the an important thing about shade on the moon is that the shade on the moon is probably really cold because there's no atmosphere. Hmm. Um, and the atmosphere, you know, at shade on the Earth, you're still subject to the atmosphere blowing warm air into your vicinity. So the temperature on the Earth is a lot more uniform, hmm. where when you go into the shade on the moon, because there's no atmosphere to convey the heat from everything's ra everything's radi radiative basically isn't yeah it? so you basically um no convection because there's, yeah, no, there's no convection no really just at least not the not to speak of and so the temperature can probably drop dr dramatically from one side to the other well mm -hmm. I, I mean a good example is mercury where it's 700 degrees fahrenheit on one side and minus 400 degrees on the <laughs> other side um just be by going into the shadow so mm -hmm. uh, the moon is going to have the same kind of fast temperature transitions mm -hmm. Um, when you go into the shade, which means that the sun isn't going to be able to boil off the, the water that's embedded in the minerals. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so let's first talk about Sophia. Yeah. Uh, the reason, so Sophia, 
is a modified 747 airplane, so via telescope. Yeah. Um, there's a guy that I worked with on Kepler who built an instrument for Sophia. Um, and so this is what it looks like in flight. Uh, we'll go with the NASA picture because they're all, their stuff's all in the public domain. So this is what the airplane looks like, the 747 with a big, with a kind of, it looks a little bit like it swallowed something in the back because uh, they've you know, changed the shape of the fuselage at the back of the airplane. It's got a garage door type thing with a telescope on it. Uh, the reason that you have to do this is that the, like the reason you have to put a telescope on an airplane is not because it's a, you know, a neat gimmick. Is it's it an atmospheric that, thing? Is it just to get higher and you don't have to go through so much atmosphere? Is this? Uh, yeah. And in particular, Sophia is, so the eye in Sophia is for infrared. Mm. Um, and the greenhouse gases and water vapor in particular uh, absorb infrared light or reflect infrared light. And so infrared light coming from space mm. uh, hitting the Earth's atmosphere is going to bounce off the Earth's atmosphere. And so it doesn't make it all the way to the surface. Mm. So if you if you look at an image of like the opacity of atmosphere versus wavelength, yeah. um, then you see that there is the depth um, that different wavelengths can penetrate the atmosphere. So the x-rays and stuff like that bounce off of the ozone layer. They don't make it to the surface. And even higher energy stuff, well, in those cases, the light that can't make it to the surface because it's going to produce a bunch of particles and you get a shower of particles. So like TEV, gamma rays, and stuff like that. Uh, visible spectrum makes it to the surface of the Earth. And then it's really bumpy when you get out of the visible spectrum into the near and mid-infrared mm. because um, there are some wavelengths where you can see quite well um, I was going to say, because the, the intergalactic center stuff I was talking with the, the chap from Max Planck about, that was IR on the ground. So there must be some right. wavelengths where it's reasonable to do yeah, so there's ground a, base infrared. There's a window uh, in, in the millimeter hmm. area, where, like millimeter wavelength. And so ALMA, the Atacama yeah, Large yeah. Millimeter Array, yeah. so that's millimeter wavelength. And that is one band of wavelength that will make it to the or close to the surface of the Earth. Um, you know, and it's, it's an exponential decay, right? And so if only 50% of it makes it, then you still have the other 50% left yeah. over. Yeah. It's not like a hard boundary. Um, the, um, but in the mid infrared, there's a lot of absorption bands from water vapor, from carbon dioxide, from ozone and things like that. Uh, and then basically the, the earth's atmosphere is opaque to a lot of stuff in the kind of far infrared. And it's not until you hit radio waves where the wavelengths are long enough to make it through the atmosphere. So the uh, so radio telescopes you can build on the surface of the Earth. Some like millimeter wavelength telescopes you can build near the surface of the Earth. Visible light spectra or visible light telescopes you can make to the surface of the Earth. Some infrared you can choose certain wavelengths. Uh, where you like have infrared filters where you can if you build it high enough on a mountain then you can um, get some stuff. So with Sophia, Sophia just flies high enough to get above most of yep. the yep. atmospheric losses, or at least enough of the atmospheric losses. And so it, it is an expensive telescope to operate, as was pointed out by someone in the in the chat. Um, but uh, you know, Keck is Keck costs like thirty million dollars per year to operate. This is a bit more than that, but it's the only instrument that's available. It's cheaper than building a telescope to launch. So like James Webb Space Telescope is an infrared telescope primarily. That, that, and so, that, never, that, that is always two years away. Yeah, so, so. it should launch um, next year and it always will launch next year. Yeah. Uh, eventually that will, it will go up. But um, so Sophia in the infrared, you know, what James Webb is something on the order of $10 billion. And this is on the order of 100 or 100 million per year. Mm -hmm. To operate it's not quite that much um but that gives you what that gives you 100 years of operation before you get to the cost of james webb space telescope and you can replace all the instruments and upgrade them mm -hmm. and and do a bunch of stuff so uh there's there is an advantage to having an instrument like this um especially since it's kind of the only way to to make those kinds of measurements and in particular the reason you want to look in the infrared for water is that uh you need a telescope like this because water interacts with infrared light 
the, the is it the vibration the vibrational modes isn't it for water is in the infrared yeah thinking it, back deep dark chemistry lectures like from, modes where yeah, it yeah. wiggles yeah um and so the um so the very reason that the earth is the atmosphere is opaque to water vapors because it has water vapor in it so you have to get above the water layer yeah, yeah. on the earth and now you can use your telescope and see water that's you know signatures of water that's coming so, in from so is what we're seeing sunlight that's being reflected off the moon and is missing light that has essentially excited water on the moon and therefore we see the the missing light in our in in, in the light in Sophia. and that gives right. us a characteristic marker of of water on the moon is that is that what yeah, we're so, seeing the so water water vapor will reflect light of certain wavelengths hmm. and so you'll get um basically the glare of that water vapor you'll get that reflected light from the well for, in this case from the water on the surface of the of the moon uh and the same you know water vapor reflects this these wavelengths and so you can't make those measurements from the ground because the water vapor in the atmosphere reflects those same wavelengths yeah so anyways it's it's a pretty cool um setup Basically, they, they choose on a given night, here's the instruments that we're going to fly, and they choose a flight path that, you know, so they fly out over the Pacific and um, get an evening um, of observations where you ask for time, and then you're allocated some window of this flight path. To, Sounds um, like a cool experiment to work on, to be fair. Yeah. So, so that's the instrument. That's the Sophia instrument. So that's one of the things that they've used. Uh, the other one I don't... Um, and then the other one was the the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which, I mean, I guess it's orbiting the moon. I, I haven't heard much about it, but this has been, it looks like, sort of mapping the amount of shadows and pits that could exist on the moon and therefore how much of this shaded uh, area there is for okay. water to potentially exist. So in the... So the one case is the actual detection of the water. The other one is to get the estimate of um, what percentage of the moon's surface is going to have the conditions necessary to have water. That's what it and, looks like. Yeah. And from this article in the BBC, it, it indicates that you can get a 12 ounce bottle yeah. of water in a cubic. Now, do you use ounces? <sighs> Nobody uses ounces anymore. But what's it? So I find it, I find it very strange that the BBC is saying a 12 ounce bottle <laughs> in a big meter and it's the meter is yeah, it's a very off. odd mashup of uh, of units there so it's uh -huh. not it's not much but it's you know a reasonable amount per meter cubed uh -huh. the uh, amount of water roughly equivalent to a 12 ounce bottle of water in a cubic meter of lunar soil yeah and it says it's it's probably stored in these bubbles of lunar glass or between grains so it looks like it's not necessarily that easy to extract uh -huh. So it's there, but the question is, would it be able to be harvested and, and would it be accessible if you had a mission that went there and set up a base on the moon? Would you be able to extract this and use this? Would it be ice? Would it be lunar glass? What would the process need to be for you to extract reasonable amounts of water? Because it's all right having this, they say roughly 15,000 square miles of shadows exist and you have this water in, you know, out in the sunlight as well. But if you can't extract it and use it, then, then it uh, might as well not be there, right? Yeah, then it might as well not be there. So, so I guess that's the next question. It's all, it's all well and good saying it's, it's there, but there's still a big question as to, as to how accessible that water will be for, to, for an astronaut who was there on the surface. So let's see. Uh, there are quite a few one-off missions to the Moon polar regions coming up in the next few years. Uh, but the longer term, there are plans to build a permanent habitation on the lunar surface. Uh, experts say that the water ice could form the basis of a future lunar economy. I mean, you have to have water. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you have to ship it up there and it becomes expensive. Yeah. Um, so, the, so the point they're making at the end of this is that if you want to establish a base, essentially you want to do it where the water is because humans need water. So yeah. where the base is going to be is largely dependent on the where the water is. Um, uh -huh. The other thing, they mentioned this constantly in this article about the moon being a step towards reaching Mars in the 2030s. And, you know, you remember we had the, this issue with the hilarious late night comedians calling out Trump for saying that the moon is a part of Mars. Um, mm. When obviously it was saying that going to the moon is, is a part of reaching Mars. Now, 
I was wondering why is this such an important step? Because is this a technical step so that we can check that our travel technology works, that we can set up a habitat, see the long-term effects of living there? Or is this about, can we access resources on these barren rocks? So can we harvest water? Can we recycle the air, get what we need? Or is it even more that the, the moon has a lower gravity so we can send multiple missions and then set up a larger mass space vehicle from there and it's easier to launch? What are the what are the reasons that the moon is so important when we're when we're trying to get to Mars? So I suspect um, that the main issue is just the amount of um, like the amount of fuel that it takes to lift something off the Earth is is so big mm. uh, because most of I remember when I went to the Kepler mission launch. Um, it's like the Kepler mission launch. It had the, it was a Delta I think it was a Delta two rocket and it had nine solid rocket boosters around the base. And the rocket takes off, and it seemed like it got, you know, about a foot and a half off the ground. And then um, a bunch of the rocket boosters had already finished all their fuel, and then yeah, were ejected yeah. off. Yeah. So when you first lift off, the main thing that you're doing is lifting the fuel off the ground. Yeah. The fuel is the heaviest part, and the more fuel you add, that's it's that much more that you have to mm -hmm. lift. And so my suspicion is that. And that's less technology, less equipment you can take as well, because. You're lugging yeah. all that fuel up with you. And so my suspicion is that if you doing a step, like the amount of fuel that it takes to get to the moon and then the amount of fuel that it takes to leave the moon and get to yeah. Mars, yeah. it's probably less than the amount of fuel that it takes mm -hmm. to go directly. I haven't done that calculation, but it doesn't actually seem that hard of a calculation to do. So maybe it's something I should try. Maybe it's something I should force my undergraduates. <laughs> well, it does um, say it does say in the article that it's much cheaper to make rocket fuel on the moon than, it, than send it from Earth. So I'm guessing that that's the point because the, the the gravity of the moon is so much lower. If you can make the fuel on the moon, you know, yeah. a space vehicle can either so go there with a small. Lot of, there's probably a lot of, of the raw ingredients already on the surface of the moon. So yeah. you can just set up a manufacturing facility. Yeah. To, that that so sounds instead like. Instead of having to carry a solid rocket booster up to the moon and then use it from there, you probably have a lot of the raw materials that you need there. And so you only have to carry half of a solid rocket booster up to the moon. Mm -hmm. And then you can mine the other half and manufacture it and, you know, get the savings that way. So that's that that makes sense to me. As what's, to why they, what's the difference in escape velocity? What is it going to go as it's going to be an eighth or, or less, isn't it? I, can't think I think it's a sixth. The sixth. Um, little G is a sixth hmm. of the, on the moon. And though and so it's going to be so there much you go. easier that's, to I think that's the main the main reason that's a stop hmm. off point um, to to conserve everything. So if you know where the water is, then that's, that tells you where you're going to make your manufacturing plant. Hmm. Um, I don't know about growing potatoes. Uh, <laughs> the word on the street is that you can grow potatoes on Mars, but I... Um, I I've, seen, have... I've seen some of these experiments where they, where they have tried to grow... Um, they tried to grow these, uh, these vegetables in... Was it Martian soil or was it... I think it was Martian soil. Um, oh, they, they, they tried to re recreate Martian soil. Recreate on. Martian soil and then and then try to grow potatoes in it. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, yeah, there's, well, Earth's soil has a lot of stuff in it. Um, it's not just, you know, pulverized rock. It's actually, yeah. um, you know, there's... Nitrates and phosphates and water it. and all sorts of stuff, yeah. But that was water on the moon. Did it make... Um, did people talk about it much um, in... In the UK? I, I saw little bits and pieces of it on on Twitter, but I didn't I didn't see too much mass massive excitement. I guess because it's a discovery that's sort of been made before as well, so I didn't see as much sort of hubbub as came with the phosphine result. Uh huh. Um, but I mean, we'll we'll see how it goes. If uh, I'm sure when it was mentioning in this article the idea of setting up a moon base, I'm sure as soon as that starts to get off the ground, there'll be a lot more uh, interest mm -hmm. and intrigue about that. Well, you could imagine setting up a moon water um, plant yeah. where, and then send the stuff back to the earth. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if people would spend um, <laughs> you know, $100,000 for 12 ounces of moon water. The, uh, Nestle will be out there straight away mining uh, up all the water. Was, well, maybe I should get in on that because... Um, get some they shares might early. Find, they might find that it tastes exactly the same as water on the earth. <laughs> so anyways, moon water. So that was a... a pretty cool discovery you know kind of unexpected because it was 
it, it actually opens up the space for what you can do on the on the moon, hmm. um, especially if you know if you're forced to be in the shadows all the time, then it means that your communication system has to be somewhat different. Um, because if you're in the shadow, that probably means you're also not really able to see the Earth either. Um, although the moon's orbit in the around the Earth and around the sun aren't aligned, and so. So you mean because if you're up near the poles, you could be sort of shell, self shading your radar signal. Right. And so you, no probably have, you probably like, have to bounce it off yeah. something, or yeah. So and now if you can put it in a, a wider variety of places, um, then you know it might simplify other things. Anyways, we we don't either way. We don't really know what the full ramifications of this discovery are, but it doesn't make it less cool necessarily. I think yeah. it's still pretty yeah, cool. Still very story. interesting. I want to know what you think. So let me know down in the comment section or over on Twitter. And if you'd like to hear and challenge more of my opinions on some of the world's biggest and most controversial topics, then remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe. I can't tell you how much it helps me out and how much more motivation I feel when you guys discuss and interact with the content. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad. <laughs>